Hello, and welcome into 615 Preps Coaches and Q. Today we're coming to you from Papa Turney's Barbecue here at the Marina on Percy Priest Lake. And our guest today is going to be DCA head coach Paul Wade. Now, Papa Turney believes in barbecue made the old fashioned way, low and slow. They're open Wednesday through Friday, and every night they have live music if you couldn't tell. So, why don't you join us? Come inside and see what's smoking. You were a walk-on at Tennessee Tech um, back uh, back in your playing days. Uh, was coaching football always a career goal? Uh, yes and no. It, it, it wasn't when I first went to college. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I knew I'd miss football. And uh, after walking on and uh, being around some of the men that I got to be around uh, there at Tech, I realized, hey, this could be something that I want to do. I changed majors got into health and physical education, and uh, obviously a lot of those men were involved in that uh, program as well at, at that level. And uh, been around some of the guys uh, that I were, I learned real quick that I wasn't uh, very good in football. And uh, so I was going to make this uh, a career path that I would uh, need to uh, learn as much as I could, and, and that's that's what I did from, from there on out. Well, Coach – yeah, you, know, you say you weren't very good, but I mean, if you have the ability to walk on, there's there's some talent there. Well, we're talking about a different day and time too. And uh, the the one thing that did help me was uh, uh, to not pat myself on the back. I was incredibly strong. Uh, I'd been a, a avid weight room guy with some of my buddies here, uh, Brad Gaines, uh, Tommy Allen, Scott Ross, uh, some of our buddies that I grew up with and that played college ball. Uh, we were avid weight room junkies and. Uh, that's the only reason I survived because I was a I was a pretty strong dude. Was it? Did they approach you about walking on, or was it just something that you oh, felt gosh. compelled to do? I was. Uh, I had to to be honest with you, the the uh, one of the coaches, actually Coach Ragland, the head coach, had a weightlifting class that I had to take as a PE elective, and he uh, never showed up. He always sent one of his other assistants to uh, to monitor the class and. Uh, those who knew how to work out, the coach would just let you go work out. Uh, the kids, who, which were mostly girls that didn't know how to work out, he actually took them to the side and instructed them in, in the proper mechanics of weightlifting. Uh, so he, he just watching me work out and see how strong I was, he actually asked me one day where I'd gone to school and where I'd played and had I ever thought about playing. I said, yeah, actually I did. I was going to wait until uh, the next fall. And he said, no, you need, you need to come out this spring and see how it works. So that's kind of what got the ball rolling. I met the strength coach. He came in and watched me work out a little bit, and then, uh, you know, the, the rest happened from that from that first day. Yeah, you know, early on you were focused on college coaching, right? That's right. If, if, I'm, if I understand correctly. Uh, what changed your mind? Well, I, was, I wasn't very good, like I mentioned, but I, I felt like I was learning the game. Uh, uh, Mike Smith, uh, who actually ended up, ended up being a head coach for the Atlanta Falcons, was our defensive line coach. Uh, Gerald Brown, who was our receiver coach, who I worked directly with, who also was at the Browns, and and, and his brother coached at UT and in many NFL teams. Uh, I was a GA under them, and uh, uh, Coach Brown, that's the second semester I was there, actually I got moved to tight ends. So I was working directly with him, and I thought, okay, this is something that you know, I, I may want to do. I, I, knew, I knew at that level, of course, at that time in the 80s, there wasn't a lot of money involved in it. But I knew that uh, uh, coaching was what I wanted to do at that point and actually met uh, George McIntyre, who had uh, retired from Vanderbilt and got into high school coaching, was actually at DCA at the time. And I met him th during a recruiting season like we're in right now. And he just happened to uh, chat with me because I was the only one in the office that morning. And he you know, just connected with me about where I was from and where I'd gone to school and where I lived, and which was just five minutes down the road from DCA. And he said that he actually had a job coming open. Would I be interested in interviewing? And I said, well, we'll see. I'm not really sure. So I remember talking to my dad and saying, hey, and he goes, well, you never know until you just go interview. He goes, I know you think you want to stay in college, but just check it out. And I did. And uh, I loved it. And I loved him. And uh, and that's he offered me a job that day. And I took it. Wow. 
Well, now you've stayed primarily in the private school sector, if I'm not mistaken. 30 years. Is that, uh, is there something about, uh, I mean, is that a plan or is that just something that, uh, you know, has just kind of happened or? Well, I became a Christian uh, at my sophomore year of college and, and hanging around uh, Christian friends and having that influence uh, uh, obviously played an important role. Uh, and then, you know, uh, uh, the godsend, as I look as it was, that the first guy that offered me a job was a former SEC head coach who was now a headmaster at a Christian school. I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, it can't get any better than this. So I went from making $300 a month to not making much more than that a month <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and in a Christian environment, and, and I loved it. And it just so happened that the jobs that followed after that just happened to be other Christian schools. My wife's a Metro teacher, has been for 28 years, so – uh, we we say that she's the public sector of the household, and I'm the private sector of the household. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a big part of uh, of uh, you know who you are is your faith. Yes, sir. Yeah, played played a big role, and uh, obviously being in it that long and, and having my kids grow up in it, and uh, and then when we moved to Ensworth, obviously Ensworth's just an independent school, doesn't have a Christian foundation. Uh, you know, it it made. Uh, it, it made us parent harder. It, it made us. It made our my kids who had been in Christian education. It made them had to be a little more uh, in tune to to the worldly things out there, you know, because we had gone from having you know the ability to pray in class before lunch to having weekly chapels to uh, being involved with uh, Christian ministries to to not being a part of that anymore. Uh, so it did, it did change the perspective of a time in our life. But uh, I went full circle and came back and with DCA. Came back around. It was a perfect, perfect time, a perfect fit. Well, you've coached. Uh, you said uh, at at various levels of of that D two that that private sector, uh, you know, do you see a whole lot of difference in those, in those divisions? It's apples and oranges. I talked mm-hmm. to a parent today who was looking to come to our school and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, I was taught by a coach a long time ago, you make the big time where you're at. So I, I, I don't look at the, the bells and the whistles and the haves and the have nots of, of what a school has, uh, cause football is football and kids are kids. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's apples and oranges when you start talking about the ends worth and, MBA and BAs of the world compared to the DCA and friendships and national Christian. There is a grave difference, but football's football. Kids are kids, and uh, uh, you make the best of, of what you got. Uh, in 2018, you return to DCA, and you find the cupboard is, is somewhat bare when you get there. Um, yet you view that as a successful season from what I've read. Why is that? Well, first of all, let me go back to the rephrase of the cupboard was bare. I didn't know it was bare. <laughs> uh, you know, I was taking over a program from a good friend of mine, Coach Goodwin, who's still there, who had just com- competed in the state championship game. Now, now, needless to say, they uh, they had the ball bounce their way too many times that 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 postseason, and really probably shouldn't have been there. Uh, they didn't near have the best team by, by no stretch of imagination, uh, but they did get to play for a state championship and ended up getting rolled by, by friendship. But w- when I got there, I knew they had a large senior class. And then uh, th- throughout that spring, because I actually was hired on my birthday, April 16th, and when I got there by the 1st of June, uh, we were down to 19 kids. We, we had kids that had transferred, kids that decided they didn't want to play anymore, had a couple of kids who had been injured, mama said we're not playing. I had a couple of kids who had transferred because of economic reasons, and all of a sudden I had 19 kids, and I was like, what what, what have I done? Uh, but, yes, it was, a, it was a – I'm not going to call it my most favorite season. It's probably a season that would, that would could construct an entire book if I, if I wrote it uh, would be that season because we had to – Convince kids that uh, that winning wasn't necessarily what was dictated by the score. Uh, right. Even though when the scoreboard comes on, you know we tell the kids we want our side to be larger than the others. Us making it through practice without getting anybody hurt. Uh, us us getting a, a first down on Friday night as opposed to punting nine times was was a success. And and I'll be honest with you guys, if you had showed up at, at, at a multitude of our games in the last few minutes of the game, the way our student body reacted to us coming off the field 
the way our band reacted to us, uh, you wouldn't have been able to tell which team won the game or not. Uh, the community wrapped their arms around us. So they knew. And, and when I say – I'm not going to say that we were bad. Uh, we were – we had no idea what we were doing. I mean, we literally put 11 guys on the field on the first series of the first game of 2018 who had never played a snap of high school football. Wow. Not one snap of high school football. Uh and out of that starting 11, there was about two two or three kids on each side of the ball who had never played football before. So when you're lining up against some of the teams that we were, uh, there was there was no chance. And it was it was a survival mode. But the, the, the trickeration, as I call it, and, and the, the community love, it, it was a very successful season. Well, that's uh, – yeah, that you, you follow that up. You, you come with – you get a winning record of eight and four. Um, you know, losing the quarterfinals to the eventual champions, Davidson County, uh, Davidson Academy, and then you enter 2020 on a roll, and then tragedy strikes with the uh, the tornado event um, shortly before spring practices. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you attack the issues that came with that? Because you had all the facility damages, the kids suffering losses, communities in shock. Not to mention on all that, you had COVID going on. Right. How, how did you manage? It, it was interesting. Uh, it was interesting because we had, uh, uh, when the tornado hit, I was actually in the process of going to visit my son, who's in the Navy, mm-hmm. who had played at the Naval Academy, and he had developed some health issues. So I had that going on top of this, uh, uh, coming off a campaign where, where we still weren't very good, but we had had a very successful year based off the previous year. And heading into this season, you know, there was a lot of excitement surrounding the program because we had a great senior class coming up, but it was being followed by two superb junior a junior and a sophomore class so there was a lot of excitement and then the tornado hit and uh, I remember getting there on that night thinking oh my gosh how's this going to work and then two weeks later COVID hit and our campus split from one campus to three campuses and and, and still when I left school today to come over here there's still contractors there trying to finish what happened in March of 2020 I mean it's crazy that it's taken this long but the damage was was real and uh, it, it forced us again to, to look at other stuff. Uh, the fact that if our school had been in session that day, uh, we probably would have lost 300 lives that day. Uh, if 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 our if the tornado had moved, you know, 10 or 15 feet either way, it would have probably done, you know, two or three more million dollars worth of damage. Uh, so there were some blessings come out of it. Uh, the fact that for the first time in 50 years of our school, there's not going to be a portable modular building on our campus. Uh, it, that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, the, the fact that we, are for the first time in history school, are going to have an auditorium, uh, that's a good thing. And, and to say for the athletic fields, obviously we got those put back pretty quick. Uh, the fence, the grass, the, the light poles, the electricity, the, the buildings, the brick and mortar. Uh, but the school is a different story because that was the, the livelihood of a bunch of uh, teachers and, and administrators and, and the livelihood of a bunch of kids uh, that we had to uh, piece back together. Uh, that we're still not there yet, but but, but we will soon be. Uh, Coach, uh, you know, your team responded with a tremendous regular season run, undefeated regular season. That's remarkable given the circumstances. Uh, what lessons can be learned from the DCA example, uh, that resiliency? Well, w- one thing we talked about from, uh, from the beginning of this year, our, our word was finish. Each year we try to pick a, a stack word or a mantra or a motto or – uh, we, however you like to phrase it. And uh, based off what we had done the, the, the previous years, it was time to do, take it to the next level. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fact that uh, we had a, a, a great group of, of seniors uh, who, were, who, who, who were ready to go, uh, many who hadn't, who hadn't got to play a whole lot in, in the previous years, and they knew it was their turn. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we, talk, we try to not spend a whole lot of time on the past, but we talk about 2018 a lot. And uh, there, there were seven seniors that were on that team that, that stayed with us. Uh, we, we added eight more. Uh, so we kind of turned the attention to them and said, hey, you know, th- this is going to finish out the way y'all wanted to. We, we never had a goal of being undefeated. Our goal was to, we, we, we split the season into three, 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 three seasons. We have weeks one through five. We have weeks six through ten, and we have the postseason. And our, the only, only goal was to get to the postseason and be as ranked as high as we could. Uh, and, and that was it. And then we'll do, do, see how the how the games played out. We went from there. How did you feel after like the the fifth game, your your first your first uh, uh, your first season, season within a season last year? Well, we we had a loss, so uh, that was a 
it, it was it was good. We needed it. Uh, we we felt too good about ourselves. Um, we weren't practicing like we should, and I actually told them on uh, uh, Tuesday of that week that we would get beat. Uh, and I, I, I'm not going to say that uh, I, I, I was bad karma, but I told them on Tuesday, I told them on Wednesday, I told them on Thursday, I told them at pregame on Friday, we are going to get beat. And, and you know, I, I, we try to preach, I, I try to preach for, I have from day one that the importance of football is what takes place on Monday through Thursday. If you don't respect Monday through Thursday, fr- Friday's, Friday's not worth it. Uh, the, the teams who are good respect Monday through Thursday. And because we thought we were good, because we had a group of seniors who were very talented, who were getting some attention, who were putting up big numbers, uh, they were just getting a little cocky. And, uh, and, and it, 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 you know, the coaches, the coaches felt it too. Uh, we felt we had things rolling. And, you know, obviously, you start peering around the state to see what's going on and uh, knew that we were we were rolling. Uh, but but Silverdale out of Chattanooga, double-A team, uh, they put us on. They put it on us, and we needed it. And that, that changed the whole mindset from, from the following Monday when we got back. So humility, the, the humility that uh, that 48-28 to 28, uh, loss was uh, something you feel that was uh, came about at the right time. It was, it was perfect time. And, and the fact that – uh, funny as it sounds, the fact that I predicted it made it even better because they, they tend to listen a little better when you say things that are true. Uh, ki- kids understand prop- propaganda, and they understand when you're lying to them. So when you, when you tell them something and it comes to fruition, they, they tend to lend the ear a little, bit, a little bit stronger next time. Oh, absolutely. I can't imagine what it, you know, what it was like uh, you know, when they walked in, uh, into the weight room the next, next practice. Yeah, it was, uh, it, we didn't have to say a whole lot because they knew because when we walked into the, the locker room after that game, all I said was, I told you. I told you what was going to happen if, if we didn't do what we were supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and things changed from that point. Uh, the mentality, the effort and practice, uh, the, the film watching. You know, a lot of people don't know that, that high, school, high school football in today's day and time is a lot about preparation, and, and that involves film study. And our kids at that point realized, hey, if, if we don't watch film and understand what's going on, uh, we're, we're putting ourselves against our backs against the wall. Well, your offense was dominant. You averaged over 40 points a game, you know, led by Bradford Gaines, your quarterback, and uh, Ashton Jones, Dayton Sneed. You had a really, really talented offense, and, and then your offensive lineman, Aiden Francis, who I believe has gone on uh, to University of Rochester. Yes, sir. Um, what was your secret to success on the offensive side of the ball? Well, I've been a, I've been a run, run guy first, and being an offensive line guy and being an offensive line coach, uh, obviously, that's where, I, that's where a lot of the emphasis tends to lend, lend itself in practice because if that group of five can't get together on the same page, it doesn't matter how good the quarterback's arm is or how fast the running back is that they're, they're going to be running for their lives. So, so we spent a lot of time uh, focusing in on those guys uh, and, uh, and, and coaching them up. And then when you put together skill guys that, that take advantage of good line play, Obviously, you're going you're to have those numbers, but you know, you know, uh, th- th- this year was coming. We saw it coming a few years ago. Heck, we have four juniors who, the day that they moved up as eighth graders, started on that 2018 team. So there's four rising seniors who are going to graduate as five-year starters. Uh, and so that's how bad we were in 18. But uh, that that says a lot about their uh, football ability. The fact that they were able to play as many plays as they've played through their high school career. Well, coming from a high sc- former high school center and uh, offensive guard, well undersized, and uh, uh, to another per- another I center, center. I was a center. That's right. Uh, tell me about the importance of that position. Well, that, that position, in my opinion, is the most important position on the field. Uh, that's why Aiden Francis, ironically, played that position because I I saw in him the ability that he had. Uh, uh, to play that, and, uh, and it's paid off for him, and it obviously it made us a very good football team. Uh, in any position that touches the ball every single play, 
uh, d- does play an important role. My son played uh, uh, center in high school and center at the Naval Academy. My, my youngest son played uh, center during his high school career. And I think not because I played it, but there has to be a trust level and, and a mental edge at that position because the ball or the play of every offensive snap begins with you. And, and everybody, you know, a lot of people say quarterback's the most important position. Well, the center's the one that hands him the ball. So there's, there's got to be a, a, a guy there who can handle – uh, the, the pressure and know what he's doing. Yeah, in a lot of ways, the center is uh, calling the protections and, and things of that nature, in, or at least the offensive line calls. Yes, sir. Our, uh, Aiden was our captain. Of, uh, he was a captain for the team, but he was also our captain of the line. Uh, he, he, he identified the Mike linebacker. He, he, he slid our protection which way it needed to go. He made calls dictating on what defenses did. And it's going to be interesting this year who, who, who that is to step up because, as we sit here today, I have no idea who that is. Now, the guards and the tackles are pretty well – uh, uh, locked in, but the center position, which has been a guy for four years who's done an unbelievable job, whoever that person is, got a big, big role to fill. Um, you know, your defense was n- no less impressive. I mean, yeah, you know, average just uh, just over 10 points per game. Well, uh, I, I was in my early career, I was a defensive coordinator, so I understand, you know, the 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 the. the the, the times that defenses get overlooked. And unfortunately, this year at times our defense did get overlooked. Anytime you have guys putting up numbers the way Dayton, uh, uh, Sneed, uh, I mean, Dayton Sneed, uh, Bradford Gaines, uh, Nacho Magali, and, and Ashton Jones, and Brady Russell, the numbers that they were putting up, a lot of times that defense does tend to, to get overlooked. Uh, the, the shutouts, you know, the, we had three or four, but nobody would really know it because the, we scored so many points. Right. Uh, but, yeah, the, de- the defense had an unbelievable season. Coach Bobian did a great job with those guys, and uh, we have quite a few of those guys back, so we're excited about this year. Go down into the uh, uh, into the Blue Cross Bowl. Uh, did you find the move to Chattanooga a positive experience for the Blue Cross Bowl? Well, I, I've played in every stadium that there's been a state championship in. I've played at Vanderbilt – or I've coached at Vanderbilt, I've coached at Middle Tennessee, I've coached at Tech, and I've coached it now at, at UTC. Uh, the UTC setup was phenomenal. Uh, the, 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 it's more of a uh, – I'm not going to say it's more of a high school atmosphere than Tech because I'm a, I'm a Tech alum, so I'm a sure. partial Tech. But they, they had a little better equipped for that many teams at one time. Uh, Cookville provided more volunteers. Uh, M- middle had a great facilities, but it was too big. Uh, Vanderbilt had great facilities, but it was too big. Chattanooga had the right size facilities. Uh, they just they, they didn't have as much community support as the other program uh, as the other sites did. Uh, but I thought it was wonderful, a wonderful venue for the state championship game. Do you expect uh, UTC to recruit the mid state a little bit harder? They if they if they don't, they don't know what they're doing. And 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 to be honest with you, UTC's not done a good job in, in Middle Tennessee. And, uh, you know, the, the, the things that took place at, at Tennessee Tech over the past uh, uh, eight or ten years, it has changed Tech's recruiting philosophy, and it will definitely change it again because, you know, having played at Tech with three of the current Tech coaches, they understand the importance of the state championship game in there. So they've gone back to the, to the drawing board to make sure the mid-state gets hit, hit and picked up again. Yeah, I find it odd that uh, UT Martin seems to, uh, seems to recruit mid-state better than UTC does. That is true. We already answered, uh, <laughs> already answered this question. We talked about Aiden Francis and replacing him, but uh, you have to replace uh, Bradford Gaines as well. You know, he's at Win- Lindsey Wilson, right, now? Well, Lindsay, yes, sir. Uh, you got to have candidates back there? We, ha- we have one. <laughs> uh, if we started today, we'd have a, the mighty 28 out there. We, we, we don't have a very big squad again. Uh, that's okay. We proved that you could do it with a few last year. Uh, Mitchell Carey is a rising sophomore. Uh, a quarterback from, you know, fifth or sixth grade mm-hmm. uh, in, in our program. So uh, uh, we have high expectations for him. Uh, late, late in the season, we actually took Bradford out of uh, practice uh, situations where uh, – when, when we were on defense and let Mitchell become the full-time scout team quarterback, and uh, uh, he proved himself very well. It was Even though he didn't get as many uh, reps in games, which is very misleading, and I actually talked with a college recruiter about that this morning uh, when he was asking, uh, you know, very similar question about what was to do to replace Bradford. And I said, well, you know, usually you, you hope to get yourself in games where you can put, you know, the younger quarterback in. And uh, really because Bradford had played so few – varsity games uh, in his high school career because he backed up Parker Kelly, who's playing at the uh, 
at Concordia University in Chicago, uh, Bradford was just a two-year starter. Uh, so he didn't have a whole lot of, of, of snaps under his belt. So when we got in games that we got ahead, we, we, we let him work on stuff to get better that we knew that would help us later in the year. And I think it paid off for us. Uh, you know, even though it kind of looked weird, you know, to win – you know, 42 to 14 and the starting quarterback still in the game, well, he's in the game because he's got stuff he needs to work on to, to get better. And for us to get to where we did, he had to be really good. And, 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 and by the time we got to Chattanooga, he, 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 had a, he, he was really good. He had a great year. Uh, how about the defense? How's it looking? We, we lose our whole back end. Uh, and anytime you lose the secondary uh, in, 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 in this – in this seven-on-seven seven world we live in now with everybody, mm. you know, throwing the ball around, uh, it, it does make us a little scared. The good thing is the, the front line and the middle row are, 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 are not fully intact but, it, but in much much better position than the back row. Uh, Ashton Jones, he split some time back there last year. Uh, 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 Cam, uh, the kid that we thought that was going to be a star for us uh, as a freshman, both offensively and defensively, uh, Broke his collarbone in our first scrimmage last year, so he missed over half the season. And it's going to be exciting to see what what Cameron can do. But uh, we're going to be really young back there and uh, very inexperienced. So we're hoping that the front two rows can protect that back row. Talk a little bit about the state of the game. Um, you know, this year we've had to schedule mandatory Thursday night games due to official shortages. You know, what do you see as the problem there, and what is the answer, do you think? Well, I, the, the only answer is is that the, the more people get involved in, in, in officiating. Uh, you know, when you have new schools pop up everywhere, when you have uh, middle school programs uh, or, 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 or counties starting middle school programs, when you have uh, uh, a youth leagues popping up everywhere now that COVID's over, and and obviously just like you know in, in the in the in the world we live in, people are paying more for hourly wages. Well, there's some places that are paying you know better rates for for officials, and when you can get you know, uh, heck, this year I think they're gonna make I, I know it's like a hundred. Fifteen hundred twenty a game, and uh, when you got seven officials on a Friday night, uh, that, that that's that ends up cutting a big part of your budget. But then we, there's places that you're on, are only taking five officials because uh, they don't have the money to do it. And uh, the, the thing, the Thursday night, I, I don't get it, to be honest with you, because the Thursday night was 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 set aside for middle school games. So now those games are going to have to be moved who also had officials assigned for them games. So if we're moving varsity to Thursday, now we got to move Thursday games to something else. Well, they still got to have officials too. So it, it almost looks like on paper you're, we're robbing Peter to pay Paul, but they say that's going to work out mathematically. Luckily for us, as you ask, uh, we picked up a game against Ezel Harding, who's, who's venturing back into 11-man football uh, because Harding Academy out of Memphis decided they needed to go down to 8-man football because of their student enrollment. Uh, so the TWCLA picked that game for us. Obviously, I wouldn't want to play National Christian on a Thursday night. And, and when I've looked through the schedule, there are some big rivalries that will take place on Friday night. And there's some coaches that will like it because it will put a lot of people in the stands. A lot of money in concession stand, and they'll do good on the gate. But uh, we were fortunate enough to have the game pick. But h how to fix it, uh, no clue. Do you think that, uh, you know, parents and casual fans uh, have had an impact as well on the officials? Uh, you, you know, that's hard to say. I think what's had the biggest impact, to be honest with you, is in a, in a, in NFHS. The fact that everybody's got the cameras on the stadiums, it, it's putting less people in the bleachers because uh, people can stay home for $10 a month and watch every game in the comfort of their home and or, or watch another game while they're flipping around during halftime or whatever. So I think I think that's been the biggest impact. Uh, the, the, the officials thing is, is bewildering, uh, like we said just a minute ago, because – this year, we ha I had more officials than I had never seen in my 30 years of coaching. And they say there's a shortage. Well, I'm seeing people every week that I've never, ever had before. So if there's a shortage, how am I seeing new people every week? But, but they, they, they say it is, and I'm trusting them at their word, and I just hope TWCLA's got a, a plan on to fix it.
you know, given the state of recruiting now with NIL deals, transfer portals and the like, how has that affected high school coaching? Well, uh, luckily, our kids probably don't, don't even know what that is. Uh, but I was actually <laughs> asked that uh, by a newspaper guy just last week uh, because there are some states who are actually uh, uh, opening the, the, the Pandora's box, if you will, to that. Uh, and I'll t- tell you guys, like I told him, I, I, I think if, if it ever got to that in Tennessee, which I, which I pray that it doesn't, but if it ever got to that, to that raid in Tennessee – it's only going to affect the school, the, the the Oaklands, the MBAs, the BAs, the, the school, the Marables, the schools who are big and who've been there uh, for a long period of time. It's not going to affect the DCAs and uh, uh, Friendship Christians of the world. It, it's only going to affect the big boys. Well, I, and I think there's a question to be had there because if you start doing things like that, then there are definite dangers, not just physically, to giving young men at this age large amounts of or large sums of money. Uh, that will make them targets probably both on the field and off. Well, I'll, I'll even take it a step farther. One thing that I've been concerned with, uh, because our kids are are watching the next level, uh, and, and the next level, you know, when it gets towards the end of the season, what do, what do a lot of the guys do? They pull themselves out of ball games uh, to protect themselves for, for the next level. Well, I'll be honest with you, I, I don't think it would affect us at DCA, but I know there's programs out there with with multiple high caliber athletes who are being recruited nationwide, who the, the next the next thing that I see happen is kids taking off the end of the season uh, to not go through the playoffs because they're going to protect themselves so they can enroll in January and go through spring practice. I, I'm not surprised that's happened yet, but I but I do see that being a, a future for us, probably more than the NIL is kids removing themselves for protection. Uh, you know, we continue to see. Uh a lot more growth in the Middle Tennessee area. Uh, you know, do you see expansion of the classes in the future, or do you see a contraction? Do you think? Uh, I, I don't think either. I, I think it'll stay as it is. I think the good thing about Division Two that, that a lot of people don't understand is that uh, the TWA does respect us. Uh, they, they we do have representation, and uh, they're they're going to look at what we want to do. They're they're not mandating the changes that take place in Division Two. Uh, nor Division One. It, it's it's vo- everything's voted on statewide for for the most part, and uh, you know the the thing that could happen in Division Two is is they can make it a little bit more even. And what I mean by that is Division One is based on not only student population, but they're going to take this amount in six A, this amount in five A, this amount in four A, where they're all equal in number. In Division Two, we still have it by population or student in Rome, excuse me, but it is not broke up evenly the way it is in Division One. There's not as many AAA. There's a lot more AA. Then there's right. a lot. If they go to that, it could definitely change the, the uh, scenery in Division Two. Well, Coach, let's, let's change directions and, and uh, take, a, take a shot at some fun questions okay. now. Okay. Yeah, the heavy-hitting ones were over, uh, or, or are they? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> um, you know, You've taught personal finance in the past, right? I have. Okay. Well, what is more annoying, someone not being able to balance a checkbook or the inability to navigate Highway 70? <laughs> more annoying would definitely be navigation of Highway 70, <laughs> a.k.a. Lebanon Road. Yeah. Uh, did you get Did you get hung up in the uh, Whataburger traffic? <laughs> uh, the Whataburger traffic. I was in the Whataburger traffic. Uh, Whataburger is one of my favorite places. And, yeah. uh and me and my wife both fought the fought the traffic in the early weeks to uh, uh, to, to see if it was as good as it is in South Alabama. Did you go during the snowstorm? That's what I want to know because I yes, saw sir, several. I did. Okay, okay, uh, I, I'll fair be enough. Honest with you, I went during <laughs> right. two snowstorms. One snowstorm was when it was bad when there was nobody else, and the second snowstorm was we were actually sitting in line when the snow began, and by the time we got through the line, everything was totally covered. It took that long. <laughs> I went by there every day after that place opened, and the line was all the way out past Chili's, and it's like, yes. now it makes sense. Yeah. I, I finally got there last weekend. I mean, it, of course, I'm a little bit further away, but it, yeah, you know, well, to be honest, I ate there yesterday. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, well, you're a cookful guy. This is an important question for you. Big O's or Ralph's? There's no comparison, Ralph's. And, and I'm – 
I'm a short time Cookville guy because I only went to school there. My wife is born and bred Cookvillian, and she would agree, Ralph's hands down. Yeah, nothing like a butter twist. That's I mean, exactly see, right. These are the important questions because, I mean, I was I was a cookful guy, too, for a short time as well. So, well, yeah, all right. I, I agree. Now, well. now, if we're going to go food in, in Cookville, it, it, barbecues uh, is, 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 the, is the place. It's not as prominent as it once was. I think they've only got one. I, I, I'm assuming it's still open, one small store. But it, they had the best barbecue since you were speaking of barbecue <laughs> in, in, in Cookville. It's a barbecue joint, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, and you know, let's keep on the food track. And Chris, this one's for you. I, I wrote this question: uh, late night snack, Mighty Mart pizza rolls, or grilled chicken nachos for Cosmo from oh my Cosmos? My goodness, <laughs> you know my answer to this is the pizza rolls. I don't know if you've had them, Coach, but well, uh, the pizza rolls where the, the the gas station right beside Tech, right at the corner, um, right beside the right beside the Fit. Never had them. Oh, uh, uh, now that are in that are in like a bun. Yeah, hands down the best. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I heard about those, and while we were up there after a game, I, I sent my wife to go get some of those. Yep. Yeah, Chris sent me up there when, uh, the the first time I did uh, Blue Cross Bowl. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's basically its own food group. It was. It was in college for sure. <laughs> <laughs> if you weren't coaching, you would be. I would be a fireman. A fireman. Yeah. And, 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 and I don't know why I would be, except for the fact that one of my best friends uh, did not go to college, and, and he chose the fire route and is a captain today. And uh, the whole time I was in college and, and keeping in connection with him, that's all I knew uh, was, was the fire department. Have a bunch of friends who were in it, have a, some former players who do it. Who do it. Uh, so that's the only thing I could guess that, that would make anything near happiness of – of, of football would be a uh, uh, fire department. Uh, coaching wise, what is your most memorable moment? Most memorable moment, it, it, well, there's multiple ones, but I'll group multiple them into one. Uh, was coaching my two boys. Uh, you know, it, it takes a it takes a unique person to coach your own kid. It takes a unique person to coach your kid at your position. It takes a unique person to coach your kid at, at the position that you played. Uh, so not only were they both offensive linemen, but they both played center. So the expectations that I set up, I set for them were higher than than what most kids were, which helped me out because they saw how hard I coached my own kids. So when I got onto them, or I had issues with parents, they 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 knew that that my kid was uh, was going to get coached harder than their kid. Uh, but the uh, so that goes back to our center stuff. But uh, just getting <laughs> being able to coach with them, uh, memorable moment with Parker, which it is in any of, of the years that I was involved in a state championship game, is when you get to pra- when you were practicing on the last day that you can possibly practice in a high school football season, and one of our coaches just ironically said coach let me get y'all's picture and he took a picture of me and parker standing there and it was the last day that we got to uh it was his last high school practice it was the last day i I got to coach him Uh, so that was that was a pretty special time price you know his team his senior year wasn't as talented um and you know so we, we made sure we took care of that each week and just in case the time ended uh but getting to coach those two guys throughout their high school career were very special moments uh, what are you most proud of as a coach? Most proud of? Uh, that, that, that's a difficult question because I, I, can go from, I can go from so many different realms. I can go from the, uh, uh, the, the realm of how many kids I've, I've been fortunate enough to help uh, in whatever uh, area get to college to play at the next level. Uh, how many kids I've coached in general who have uh, who have stayed in contact and the schools that I have followed around. We, we talked about uh, uh, one question that I was asked uh, in, in an interview was about relationships and, and being a relationship guy. And, you know, and, and I'll tell you guys, I've had I've had kids from other that I coached at other schools come to our to come to the games that I'm coaching at now as opposed to going to their alma mater. So when you develop a relationship with kids who come watch you at whatever school you're coaching as opposed to going back to the school they played at, you, you know you've made an impact in their lives. Uh, the, 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 being around the kids who, who I know that uh, that I played very little role in, but kids I know who have, that became Christians during their high school and college career, you know, and you, th- you think back, you know, hopefully there was something I did or said that, that played an impact on that. So, so coming from different areas, uh, you know, there's there, there, you, you can go so many ways, you know, 
that's not even mentioned in the state championship games. You know, uh, watching my wife be the uh, most perfect uh, football mom and football wife there could possibly be, and her supporting us uh, in a house full of boys uh, playing a game. Uh, you know how special that, that time is, and, and how special just her supporting us is. So th- 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 those are a lot. Uh, you can't pick out any one in particular, but those are just some special times from for, for my history. When your coaching career is over. What do you want your coaching epitaph to be? <laughs> oh God! Uh, uh, well, the, the the old, I guess, uh, cliche that they they don't care what you know till you know that you care. Uh, I feel like I have the ability to absolutely uh, uh, annihilate a kid in, in a coaching style on the field, and then walk through the locker room after practice. And love him up and carry on a conversation where he knows that what just occurred uh, was for the betterment of himself, for the betterment of the team, that it was not personal. Uh, so you know, so I think I think maybe t- t- maybe that he cared. Uh, it would 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 be good. That's a, uh, that that is a a great epitaph. Uh, Chris, do you have anything? Nothing else to add on my end. Well, I don't have anything. Uh, I don't think uh, I have anything left, Coach. I do know the food just arrived, so uh, that's probably why <laughs> I'm cutting <laughs> he it doesn't off. Have here. a question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm distracted by the food. Yeah, um, Coach, thank you so much yes, for sir. joining us. Let's. Uh, uh, we do appreciate it, and uh, hey, let's eat some food. Yeah, do it. All let's right, brisket, nice. cabbage, macaroni, and cheese. Oh, there we go. Nice. Oh, we got a big piece right there. That's my favorite cabbage ever. Good stuff. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. Just tell me what you think about it. Oh, okay. Oh, that's good. <laughs>